Hello, I'm Daniela. In today's video, I'm going to show five tips for quickly starting your slow stitching, particularly with the Stitch With Me in 2023. Now I have a longer, in-depth video on really starting the slow stitching process. And then I have lots of videos on various techniques, but today's video tries to encompass the basics in a nutshell. So let's jump right in and get started. The first question I usually get asked is what needle do I start with? Well, unfortunately, there's not a beginner's sewing needle. You find a needle that you like based on the fabric and the thread that you're using. And I'll just show you some of the things that I do to figure out what needle I want to use. So there are lots of needles to purchase. Some are very inexpensive. The regular price retails for under $3 for a pack that will last you a very long time. The needle question is very in-depth and involved, but there's also a short answer. And the short answer is, use whatever needle you like. The question then becomes, how do I find the needle that I like? I have a video that really dives deep into using whatever needles that you like to use. It's the feel of what you're pulling through the fabric and typically what type of thread you use, more specifically the thickness of the thread. So there's everything from these thick tapestry needles, if you're stitching through upholstery fabric or corduroy or denim, and there's also denim needles as well. But I find darner needles are really good. They come in packs and they have different sizes. So this is one to five, there's five to 10 and so on. I like them because they're long and they have a large hole. If you're stitching with delicate fabric, you'll wanna stitch with a smaller, thinner needle. So a milliner's needle, would be the one for you if you like stitching through tulle and lightweight fabrics. Another very comfortable one, and this costs a little more, is the Shishiko needle. These are a Japanese needle and they're lovely. You can buy them nice and long or a set like this with all different lengths. The hole is a very decent size for threading. It will hold embroidery floss all six strands quite nicely. And they come with these little test tubes here to store them in. And once you have the needles out of the package, I find it very difficult to tell them apart. Yes, if they really stand out, perhaps these have a long, um, wide eye, similar to the tapestry, then you can basically point those out. But once these are out of the package, it's very hard to tell what they are. So the basic way to do this is find the needle you like and just run with it. And you can always add to your collection if you wanna try some other needles, embroidery needles or in-betweens and so on. Along with the theme of needles comes the idea of a dedicated pin cushion. Now, when I say dedicated pin cushion, it's kind of a thing because I do a lot of videos, I probably have five to 10 pin cushions working at any time. I like to keep just one on screen just so I don't confuse the viewer. Now this is what I mean by my working pin cushions. As you can see, they're quite a mess. The ones that I'll have on screen, I try and neaten up and only keep a few pins and a few needles in them. My pin cushions that are off screen though, I keep my thread threaded through the needles because that way they're easier to spot. It's just something that happens with age. It's just easier to spot this than if I had all my needles stuck in without the thread. So that's just by design, something you, when your eyesight starts to go, an easier way to do this. Another quick tip is to keep a magnet around your studio in case you drop a needle and you can't see it. A magnet, if you just run it over the area where you think you dropped it, there's a good chance it'll pick it up for you before your foot does. So after I have the needle, then the question is, what type of thread do I use? Because there's so much thread available. And once again, there's no short answer, but the easiest answer is just use whatever thread you like. If you can pull that thread through fabric, go ahead and use it. Now some thread glides easily, some thread is a little more finicky, and so you get to learn which ones you prefer and which ones you don't like. But here's just a quick little guide. So then you have your needles chosen. What about thread? Well, we're lucky because embroidery floss is very inexpensive and comes in gorgeous colors. There's also a trick with embroidery floss, and I happen to have a video on that as well, where you can separate the six strands so you can get a very thin thread, or you can just use two threads or more in your work. Typically, I tend to use all six, but it gives a very chunky result. And there'll be times when you don't wanna use all six, 
And particularly if you only have a little bit of thread left and you want to extend to finish your project, you might use just two strands at a time. And this way you can finish your project with the same color thread. Most threads have some sort of identification when you purchase them. They'll have a number and a brand. So I try and record the number, but it doesn't always happen that well. I do have a notebook with my projects, but if I lose the marker on my piece, well, they come in so many different colors that it's very hard to match it up again. And there are different brands of thread. DMC is a particular favorite of mine because I just think it's lovely and it has a beautiful sheen and it comes in different varieties, but this is just the standard one. Iris is another brand. I think it was a gift to me. I think it has more of a matte finish. It's still an acceptable thread and it comes in beautiful colors as well, but they're not always the same number for each company. After my embroidery floss is taken off of the skein that it comes in, I wrap it around these little holders. These are just interesting shapes that I happen to like. You can use a little piece of cardboard or you can make your own as well. I just think these little shapes make it a little more enjoyable. And then I have this pearl. It comes in different thicknesses based on the number, eight, 10, and so on. It comes in gorgeous colors as well. And it comes on this little roll. I have quite the assortment of them and you use them just like you use embroidery floss, but you don't take them apart. You just use them right from the skein. Whatever piece you use or how many strands you use is completely up to you in slow stitching. If you're following an embroidery pattern or cross stitch, it will tell you how many strands to use. But the beauty of slow stitching is you use what you want. Another question I get asked about is about using fabric. And how do I make that fabric have that torn edge or have that straight edge? You can fold it and press it and hem it just like a seamstress does. But with slow stitching, most of the time you don't even have to bother. So here's what I do to get those different edges and to cut my fabric a certain way. So for fabric cutting, you really want to dedicate a pair of scissors. The really great scissors are sewing scissors. And they're designed to cut fabric. You can get away with buying office supply scissors, provided they're sharp and brand new. And then I usually just mark on them fabric with a Sharpie marker. I'll write that on my piece. And everybody in my household knows to check the scissors before that you use them. If I catch someone using my fabric scissors for paper or God forbid wire, oof, heads will roll. Sometimes you might see these smaller scissors. They're called snips or thread snips. They're not really designed for cutting fabric. They're designed for cutting thread. So either you have your needle and you wanna cut your thread or right from the skein. It's just a small little pair of scissors and it makes it very easy. And this is handy for particularly for travel. If you have a bag that you keep in your purse and you just wanna do some stitching when you're running errands or if you're waiting to run your errands. It's small enough that it doesn't take up as much space as a full pair of scissors. And then perhaps you've seen the pinking shears. You can also get them scalloped. And you can get them in different sizes. Now they each have their purpose. So I'm going to remove the thread snips now because I want to talk about fabric. Now when you cut fabric, particularly cotton fabric or even cotton blends, it will unravel. So when you cut it, you get first get this nice clean cut, but then you can see that just with just a little pull, it starts to unravel. In slow stitching, we use this to our advantage. It creates a very interesting edge. And the more I pull out, I get a thicker edge here, kind of like fringe. And I can use that to my advantage. It's actually very interesting. If you're sewing fabric for something functional, like a placemat or article of clothing, you don't want that fringe. You can use a little bit of glue on the end to prevent it from unraveling. But because the slow stitching pieces aren't specifically functional, that's okay. Now, if you want to get that without doing a lot of work, that edge, particularly with cotton fabric, you make a gentle cut and then you gently pull it apart. And you want to gently pull it apart so that you get that fringe. You can just remove those extra little pieces and it does warp the fabric a little. Now, if I make that cut and I really yank it, it really tends to destroy the fabric. 
Again, this may be a desired effect to get that twisted and interesting shape. You can remove the extra pieces. And there you have the fabric. It is a little bit damaged. You can press it flat again. And it's still very interesting for slow stitching, but it really isn't great for the fabric for most projects. Now I wanted to just show you, in case you're not familiar, with the pinking shears, when you cut with the pinking shears, get that patterned edge. People who do paper arts are very familiar because some of the patterned scissors are quite interesting. In sewing though, when you cut with pinking shears, it prevents the edge from unraveling. It doesn't eliminate it, but it does prevent it. And it gives an interesting edge, so you may want to use that in your work. And once again, they're not required. They're just something that stitchers and seamstresses have been using for many years. So then the next question arises, after you have your fabric selected and cut out and designed, so you have your fabric collage on your piece, but before you start stitching it, how do you move that piece around so you don't lose your design? Most people use little sewing pins, but there's also other methods you can use, particularly if you don't want to use the pins. So in slow stitching, one of the things that we work on is fabric collage, where we take our fabric, whether they're pieces that we intentionally cut, pieces we found along the way, pieces we've trimmed down, anything along those lines, and we attach it and make our design. Now once you have your design, the next step is to stitch it in place. But from here, picking this up and moving it around, the pieces will move. So one thing is if I have a particularly complex piece, I'll just use my phone and take a quick snapshot of it. And this way I'll have it saved in case I can't get back to what it looks like. But other than that, you're gonna to wanna to attach it temporarily to your base fabric. Now you can do that with pins, or you can do that even with just a little bit of glue. And when I say a little bit of glue, this is a glue stick, just from the office supply section. I mean just a little bit of glue. So if I was going to tack this hot pink piece down, I would add just a dab of glue, just enough to give the pink fabric a little bit of texture, and it really grips on to the fabric underneath it. I don't wanna to add too much of this glue because then when I go to stitch through it, it'll be very gummy, but a little bit of glue is fine. If you're not into using the glue, if you're a purist, or you just don't wanna bother with the glue, which is totally fine, Many seamstresses and stitchers will use pins. And so you wanna make sure all your pins are facing the same way, ideally. Now, in a lot of situations, you can't do that based on how your fabric is and how you're trying to attach different pieces. But for the most part, you try and pin your piece down in this manner. Pins are very helpful, but they're also very pokey, and I tend to get poked quite a bit. So I like to come up with alternatives. Some people use a little piece of transparent tape, like a little scotch tape, just as a temporary measure to hold their piece down, and that works. And then other people use these magnets. You just have two magnets. You put one underneath and one on top. And this will hold your fabric together as well. And then this is just another magnet in a different shape. So again, I'll just place it down on my fabric put the top piece down, and now I can start stitching to hold it in place. And the last question that I get asked is about fabric scraps. Should I save everything? Do I have to save everything? Is it worth it to save everything? Well, these questions are really up to you. I tend to save my fabric scraps based on the size scrap. Again, that's personal preference. You can save them by color. You can put them in clear plastic bags or drawers. I keep them in little tubs and I'll show you how I do that. So one thing you'll develop, if you haven't already, is when you're slow stitching, you get a lot of odds and ends, little pieces left over from your fabric. So what I like to do is create them in little piles and every so often, can be sometimes twice a year, can sometimes be once every five years. If I'm sick of them, I'll put them in a bin and donate them away. But how I store them for my work throughout the year is I just get these little shallow buckets. These are nice. Can also get some small clear ones. And I get two or three of them, and then I just fill them according to the size. 
Some people who want to fill them might choose to fill them according to color. I just like to fill them according to size because mostly when I'm looking for something, if I'm looking for a particular color, I have in mind a particular size that I need. So then I can just go through here and say, oh, I need something in purple and I'll see what size I have. So that's how I store my little scraps in a way that's really useful for me. So those are five quick tips that I could recommend for when you're starting out slow stitching or when you're starting the Stitch With Me in 2023 project. It's a kind of a time consuming and a little space consuming, but I definitely think it's worth it. If you'd like to join our Facebook group, please click on the link below. It's a private Facebook group where we can talk about the projects, talk about our work and the prompts in Stitch With Me in 2023. If you've enjoyed this video, please be sure to subscribe to my channel. Thanks for joining me today.